Hello everyone, welcome to Cash Crop TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ages of Empires, where we will be covering all the major world empires throughout history. In this episode, we will be covering the Gurjara Pratahara dynasty and the Khazar Khaganate. And as well, from each empire, we will highlight a specific leader to learn a bit more about the respective empires, but also to make it in the style of Plutarch's Parallel Lives, probably the most influential book in my life. So we will highlight a leader from each empire, and at the end of the episode, we will have a comparison between the two leaders to learn a bit more about their empires, and a bit more about how they're unique relative to each other, and perhaps distill what makes these leaders unique, or distill, distill why one might be able to succeed or fail based on their differences or similarities. So thus, that is the structure of the episode, and without further ado, we will start with the first empire, then move to the first leader, then the second empire, second leader, and then the comparison. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy. So the Gurjara Pratihara dynasty was a dynasty that ruled much of northern India from the mid 8th to the 11th century CE common era. They ruled first at Ujjain as their capital and later at Kanauj, their later capital. The Gurjara Pratihara were instrumental in containing the Arab armies moving east of the Indus Valley River or the Indus River. Nagabata the first defeated the Arab army under Junaid and Tamin in the Caliphate campaigns in India. Under Nagabata the second, the Gujara Pratiharas became the most powerful dynasty in northern India. We shall see. He was succeeded by his son Ramabhadra, who ruled briefly before being succeeded by his son Mihara Boja. Under Boja and his successors, Mahendrapala I, the Gurjara Pratihara dynasty reached its peak and prosperity and power, as we shall see. By the time the Mahendrapala, the by the time of the Madrapala, the extent of the territory rivaled that of the Gupta Empire, which is an important empire that we have previously covered in ancient Indian history. Stretching from the border of Sindh in the west to Bengal in the east, and from the Himalayas in the north to the areas it passed Narmada in the south, if you're familiar with these regions. The expansion triggered the tripartite power struggle with the Rashtrakutra and Pala empires for control of the Indian subcontinent, as we can see on the map soon. This is just a brief overview to start. During this period, Imperial Pratihara took the title Maharaja Diraja of Aryavarta, or the King of Kings, or King of the Aryan Lands, with the title. We'll call it Raja for short, which essentially means a king. Multiple inscriptions of their neighboring dynasties describe the Pratiharas of as Gujara. So why do we call them Gujara, or Gurjara, Pratihara? The term Gujara Pratihara occurs only in the Rajor inscription of the feudatory ruler named Mathanda, Mathanadeva, who describes himself as a Gurjara Pratihara. So that was the only reference we actually have to this sort of hyphenated name. According to one school of thought, Gurjara was the name of the territory see, uh, originally ruled by the Pratiharas. Pratiharas were the ruling dynasty. Gradually, the term came to denote the people in this territory. This is one theory. The opposing theory is that the is that Gurjara was the name of the tribe which the dynasty belonged, and the Pratihara was the clan of the tribe. So nonetheless, we could call it just the Pratihara dynasty because it was the Pratiharas who ruled the region, but this one leader added the Gurjara hyphenated, so we it's commonly written like this. So try not to stop too... Uh, the point is, that they probably have some descendancy or some relation to Gurjara, and Pratihara was essentially the ruling tribe of this clan. So, furthermore, the origin of the dynasty and the meaning of the term Gurjara in its name a topic to debate, so we'll get to that. But nonetheless, we're going to go into and try to find the rise and fall in the style of, of Gibbons, decline and fall of the Roman Empire, or Shearer's rise and fall of the Third Reich. So that's sort of how I've kind of thought would be the best way to approach learning about empires, learning about how they rise and fall, see where they peak as well, and sort of where that turning point is that leads to their decline. And I think that's also useful to analyze political science today. We can look at 
empires or countries and see are they at their peak? Are they going to fall? Why might they fall? What can we learn from history? And also, why might they rise as well? So, starting with the rise of the Pratihara dynasty. So the Pratiharas rose to prominence in the starting in the 6th century in present-day Rajasthan, India, which is a place I've been fortunate to visit, actually. They were originally a clan of the Gurjara community, which is one of the theories, or they're from the Gurjara region, and gradually established their power base in the region. The earliest known ruler of the dynasty was Nagabata I, who expanded the territory and laid the foundation of what would become a powerful empire and dynasty. As for the expansion and golden age, the Pratihara dynasty reached its zenith under rulers like Boja I, who we will highlight, and Mahendrapala I. They expanded their territory through military conquests and diplomatic alliances, establishing control over vast swaths of North India, including parts of present-day Rajasthan, Gur Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, and Haryana. My apologies in advance for the pronunciation, I'm not a native speaker, However, I'm trying to do my best. I'm trying to also make it phonetical too, so if the subtitles can track the word at least phonetically, one can Google search it and perhaps find the correct pronunciation. But my apologies to those who recognize when I'm mispronouncing. The dynasty's capital shifted between various cities, including Kanauj and Ujjain. Ujjain was the prior capital, depending on the ruler's preferences and strategic considerations. As for cultural and architectural patronage in this important empire, during the Golden Age, the Patrahara dynasty were patrons of art, literature, and architecture. A very common theme throughout even the earliest Indian ancient empires were very you know, culturally adept. They supported the construction of temples, forts, and other architectural marvels, contributing to the cultural richness of the region. So very beautiful architecture we will point out soon. And also many of the larger empires that we've also covered have been nomadic, so many of them have not been sedentary like this. So this is perhaps a twofold achievement too. But as for challenges and decline, which inevitably come to all empires that have passed through history, the Pratihari dynasty faced internal conflicts, succession disputes, and external threats from rival kingdoms, such as the Rashtrakutas and the Palas. These challenges weakened the, the dynasty and contributed to its decline. So I always note that there's most empires, there's sort of the couple, the internal and external factors sort of feed into each other. A weak, for example, succession disputes, if there's a succession dispute and then the neighboring uh, force capitalizes on it, it's, it obviously makes it twofold worse. But also if there's external threats, maybe there's more likely to have a coup or some succession disputes. The Rash Trakuta king, Govinda III, dealt a severe blow to the Pratiharas by defeating them in the battle and capturing their capital, Kanauj, in the early 9th century. So, very significant defeat by that leader. As for the end of the dynasty, which soon followed, although the Pratihara dynasty managed to survive the Rash, uh, Rash Trakuta invasion and continued to rule parts of North India for a few more centuries, it gradually declined in power and influence. So, this sort of Blow. It was not a decisive blow, but it sort of foreshadowed the fall of the empire. The Chandelas, Kalachuris, and Chamanas emerged as significant regional powers as well, further eroding the Pratihara authority. So not only that one major one, the Rashtra Trakutas, but also these other smaller ones. By the 11th century, the dynasty had lost much of its territory, and its remaining territories were eventually absorbed by emerging kingdoms like the Chula. Chulukyas and the Gahadavalas. Thus, as for the legacy of this important and fascinating empire, despite its eventual decline, the Pratihara dynasty left a lasting impact on in Indian history. Its rulers played a crucial role in shaping the political landscape in medieval North India. The Pratihara kings' contri contributions to art, literature, and architecture enriched the cultural heritage of the region. While the dynasty may have faded into obscurity, its influence endured the centuries, leaving an indelible mark on Indian history. It's a very, very important empire and, uh, and a, a key event in also particularly Indian history as we track starting from the Indus Valley civilizations up until this time, and we will continue forward, forward too. So as for the specific leader, as alluded to before, Raja or King Boja I. So King Boja I, one of the most significant rulers of the Pratihara dynasty, was 
also known as Mihiri Bojo. Therefore, we seek to find a history or a biography of his life. So starting with some background information, he reigned from 1010 to 1050. Oh, this, uh, some of these dates are up to dispute, so but he, he reigned for perhaps around 45 years, which is quite a long reign, for, considering life expectancy wasn't as long, but for example, the Tithrakaras allegedly lived hundreds and hundreds of years in Britain, perhaps in Hindi, Hindu religion, etc. And Buddhism, many of the historical figures, or Jainism, live infinitely long, or very long periods of time, so perhaps maybe life expectancy in ancient India was very long, or even longer than today. And he was an Indian king from the Paramana dynasty, which was one of the Pratahara, uh, or the Pratahara dynasty. His kingdom was centered in the Malwa region in central India, where his capital in modern-day Dar was located. Boja fought wars with nearly all his neighbors in an attempt to extend his kingdoms with varying degrees of success. At its zenith, or his zenith, his empire extended from Chitor in the north to upper Konkan in the south, and from Sambarmati River to the west and to Vichita in the east, so a very massive territory. As for his early life and ascension, Boja I was born in the early 9th century, likely around 836 CE, into the Pratahara royal family. His exact parentage is debated among historians, but it is, he is believed to have been a descendant of the earlier Pratahara rulers. Boja I ascended to the throne of the Pratahara dynasty in Kanauj, which was the capital at the time, a strategically important city in present-day Uttar Pradesh, India, following the death of his predecessor, Rambada, uh, Ramabada. So some say that maybe he was actually in fact, more likely a, a general and didn't have the royal family, but the consensus is that he was from the royal family. So not all of our great leaders came from the most powerful lineage, but he seemed to, in his case, came from the most powerful lineage in the region. So, As for his military campaigns and expansion, Boja I is renowned for his military prowess and successful military campaigns, which significantly expanded the territory of the Pratahara Empire. He launched expeditions against rival kingdoms, including the Rashtrakutas, who would later deal a, a fatal blow, in the south and the Palas in the east, consolidating Pratahara control over large parts in North India. Boja the first conquest extended the Pratahara influence in the Himalayas in the north and the Narmada River in the south, from the Ar Valley Range in the west to the Ganges River in the east. So as we see that. For example, the Tibetan Empire, which we previously covered, is also there, a um, formidable force as well. It might be noted that later it's the uh, rash, tra rash Trakutas who would deal that decisive blow, but then they still last two other years, 200 other years. But if Raja Boja I had been leader at the time, maybe they might not have been as successful. As for his administration and governance policies, as a ruler, Boja I was known for his administrative acumen and efficient governance. He implemented reforms to strengthen the administrative machinery of the Pratahara Empire, improving taxation systems, promoting trade and commerce, and fostering cultural and religious harmony among diverse communities in his realm. So even today, uh, India is very um, diverse relative to other large countries such as China. It's relatively quite diverse, many different dialects, many different languages. And even this seems to be true even at this ancient time. Furthermore, it's also noted that they have taxation systems, so they must have had private enterprises, but also the taxation system was at least important in establishing the significant architectural achievements that they achieved and many other predecessing or other nations were not able to achieve, maybe through not having as great taxation policies as implemented by Boja I. As for his patronage of the arts and culture, Boja I was a great patron of the arts, literature, and culture. His court attracted scholars, poets, artists, and intellectuals from across the Indian subcontinent, contributing to the vibrant cultural milieu in Kanauj, the capital. Boja I himself was reputed to be a scholar and a poet, and he composed several literary works in Sanskrit, including poetic compositions and treaties on various subjects, so sort of the philosophical leader. He sponsored the construction of temples, as we shall see some beautiful ones, patronized religious institutions, and supported the translation of important texts into Sanskrit, a language I'm endeavoring to learn. It's an ancient language, but one of the most important in terms of studying history. As for his legacy and influence, Bodhra I's reign is often regarded as a golden age for the Pratahara dynasty. 
His military achievements, administrative reforms, and patronage of the arts and culture left a lasting impact on the um, mid history of medieval India. Boja's first contributions to literature and scholarship continued to be revered long after his reign, and even to this day. While later generations of poets and scholars cited his works as exemplary, the Pratihara Empire reached its zenith under his rule, and the Pratihara Empire uh, and his legacy endured as a symbol of Pratihara power and glory. But it might be noted, if you are at the zenith, that necessarily means your descendants or those who followed you did not succeed, so maybe his succession planning could have been done better, maybe he could have trained his predecessors better. So it's not necessarily a good thing to be at the zenith of an empire, but maybe it wasn't in his control, maybe he... Maybe those who after him inevitably would have failed. As for his later years and succession, Boja the first reign, uh, these are less documented, unfortunately, but it is believed that he contributed to the rule of the Pratihara Empire until his death. So, not transition. Some leaders, as we see in Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire, a lot of empire, emperors would name the descendant Caesar or before becoming Augustus or the names changed over time, but nonetheless sort of giving them power to smooth the transition rather than have an abrupt death and then suddenly, um, which usually comes as a surprise. So this seems to be the case though, however. So maybe if he had let the successing leader start a little earlier, maybe they would have been more successful. But nonetheless, this, his succeeding leader was quite successful anyways, and the zenith wasn't a huge drop off after his leadership. Likely in the mid ninth century was likely the time of his death. Following his demise, Boja I was succeeded by his descendants who contributed to rule, continued to rule the Pratihara dynasty for several more generations, albeit with varying degrees of success and stability and generally decline. However, none could match the remarkable achievements and enduring legacy of Boja I, the illustrious ruler of the Pratihara Empire. So that is Raja Boja I and the Gurjara Pratihara dynasty. So as for the content of the slide, we have the title. Rajaboja I and Gurjara Pratihara dynasty. It's also claimed they claim descendants of the legendary hero Lakshmana, which would be a fascinating side topic to worthy research. They were a self designated Pratihara ruling dynasty from Gurjara territory or the Gurjara tribe. So that's where the Gurjara comes from, allegedly. As for significant leader, we have Rajaboja I. Empire was the Gurjara Pratihara dynasty. The period was circa, that means approximately 730 to 1036 CE, Common Era, which is late classical India or medieval India. So there's an overlap between late classical and medieval, so it sort of depends on the region. That's why these sort of periods are, there's a lot of overlap, and it also is location dependent. For example, the medieval period in India was very different from the medieval period in Europe, but nonetheless, this is considered late classical India generally. The modern location is India, primarily primarily northern India, as we shall see on the map soon. Afghanistan, however, as well, Pakistan and Bangladesh, Bangladesh to a lesser degree. A million square kilometers was 1.0, which is about, I would say, maybe average for the empires that we've covered so far, but still very, very large. Million square kilometers is 0 0.39 percent of the world is 0 0.74 percent, which is, and this is a very populated region, however, so it is, it's not like that. Uh, one million square kilometers of you know, well, emptiness. It was one million square kilometers of sedentary people. So many of our nomadic empires covered larger territories, but they were riding on horseback and hadn't built cities. Whereas the Gurjara Pratihara dynasty were sedentary and they built these beautiful temples, as we shall see. So I think maybe that just comparing the numbers alone is not sufficient. And, but some of the largest empires we've covered so far, for example, the Umayyad and the Abbasid dynasty got up to 11, um, which are the tied for seventh largest. So quite a bit smaller than some of those, but nonetheless, I would say about average. But then, for example, Athens and Sparta, very, very famous empires that are not even 0.01%. So much, much larger. And perhaps many people know about Athens and Sparta, but don't know about the Gurjara Pratihara dynasty. So maybe that's a bit of a blind spot. As for government, is monarchy, or ruled by a Raja. Common languages were Sanskrit and Prakrit, and the religion was Hinduism. And the population was likely in several millions. What do several millions mean? Probably between three and anywhere up to 99, but probably less, than, probably less than 10. I would say between three and maybe 15 on the high end. That's very quite large compared to many of the empires we covered today, but considering the population of India today, which is over a billion, and as of 
2023, I believe, the largest country in the world by population, surpassing China. It is now 2024 today. As for the images, in the top left, we have a statue of Raja Boja in Bhopal. Very uh, lustrous, but you can see and uh, Yeah, kind of get a real a feel for kind of who he was. Seems like he's also, obviously, oh, has a sword and a war-like in individual, but you can also, I can also see a scholarly element in him. To the right of that is the Gurjar Pratahara coinage of Mihira Buji, Boja, king of Kanaj, which is him as well. Uh, and we can observe a boar incarnation of Vishnu, one of their gods, and the solar symbol. And we can see tra traces of Sasanian type, so the Sasanian empire as well, so descendants or connection there. On the legend, it says Simrad Adi Barhara, or the fortunate primable boar. So very important coins, kind of seeing the melt, the blend of the cultural influences in the region. Uh, below that, we have some additional information. It was established in circa 730 CE, as mentioned below. The conquest of Kanaj by Mahmud of Ghazni was in 1008 CE, and it was just disestablished in 1036 CE. Key events. So to the right of that, we have the Teli Kamandir, is a, which is a Hindu temple built in by Mihara Boja as well. Oh, absolutely beautiful, beautiful building. I, don't, I, I do not believe I've seen any of these structures, but I have been to Rajasthan, Udaipur, Jaipur, so I've seen some, perhaps some of these sites that were created during this time, but I don't believe I've seen these three beautiful ones. I'm very fascinated in architecture. I think it's sort of the, the pinnacle of trades. There's a great book, The Fountainhead, often gets a bad rep, but nonetheless, the, in The Fountainhead, the main protagonist, he starts off, as, starts from the bottom, does all the plumbing and everything, he works his way all the way up, and once he masters the basics, then he's capable of manifesting the art portion. So architecture is really once all the trades come together and form something creative and artistic, and it's really, it's three-dimensional, I think it's really just what one of my favorite forms of art. Uh, below that, we have the Gataswara Madahebab Temple in Baroli Temples Complex. And the complex of eight temples built by Gurjara Prataharas is situated in within a walled enclosure. It's beautiful as well. And to the right of that, we have the Batshwar Hindu Temples in Madhya Pradesh. It was built by the Gurjara Prataharas. To the right of that, we have some signif other significant information. So it was preceded by the Chavda dynasty and the Varman dynasty of Kanaj. And it was succeeded by the Pala Empire, the Chandala Emp or Chandela Emp dynasty, the Parmara dynasty, Kal the Kalachuris of Tripuri, the Tamara dynasty, the Chadva dynasty once again, the Chahamanas of Shakambari, the Ghaznavid Empire and the Guila, Guhila dynasty, pardon me. And in the top right, we have a map. Uh, unfortunately, for some reason, no matter how much I tried to correct this, the, the text of these smaller cities is not, um, it's not legible even for me, sitting so close, but here's the capital right here, the first capital, Uj, um, uh, Ujain, um, or, and then, uh, Kanaj is, is, not, is not listed here, unfortunately. But nonetheless, here is, we can see it's in North India. We can see the Tibet Empire. So we can see this is between 800 and 950 CE in South Asia. The Tang Dynasty up here. We have the uh, Safarid Sultanate here. And we have the Rash Trakutas who threatened them and ultimately captured their city and probably made that decisive blow to the empire. And the Palas to the east as well, who later became a formidable force against them as well. So that is the Gurjara Pratahara dynasty and Raja Boja I, and we will talk a bit more about both through the comparison at the end. After discussing the Khazar Khaganate and Kagan Bulan. So the Khazar Khaganate, or the Khazars, were a nomadic Turkic people that in the late 6th century CE established a major commercial empire covering the southeastern section of modern European Russia, southern Ukraine, Crimea, and Kazakhstan. They created what, for its duration, was the most powerful polity to emerge from the breakup of the Western Turkic Khaganate. So we covered the Western Turkic Khaganate in the first Turkic Khaganate episode. So it kind of split into a West and East, but we, I combined them into one full empire. 
astride a major artery of commerce bet between Eastern Europe and Southwestern Asia, so on a trade route, some uh, many empires on the Silk Road, for example, benefited, but this is a different region, but nonetheless between Eastern Europe and Southwestern Asia. Khazar became one of the uh, one of the foremost trading empires in the early medieval world, commanding the western marches of the Silk Road, so the western portion of the Silk Road, and playing a key commercial role as a crossroad between China and the Middle East. So they were on the Silk Road, pardon me, between China, the Middle East, and the Kievan Rus. Kiev, we shall see, is a, in, in modern day Ukraine, and Kiev is a city, very ancient, and we'll see, it's played an important role in this empire and also the first Bulgarian Empire, which we previously covered, as we shall see. Was for some centuries, from circa 650 to 965 or 969, the Khazars dominated a vast area extending from the Volga Don steppes to the eastern Crimea and northern Caucasus. Khazaria long served as a buffer state between the Byzantine Empire, which we have covered, and both the nomads of the northern steppes and the Umayyad Caliphate, which we've also covered, and the Abbasid Caliphate, after serving the Byzantine Empire's proxy against the Sasanian Empire, which we've also covered. But it would become its own more powerful empire in its own right. So it sort of served as a buffer state between some of these powerful states, particularly the Byzantine Empire and the Abbasid Empire, or the Umayyad Caliphate, pardon me, uh, well, the Abbasid Caliphate or the Umayyad Caliphate and the Byzantine Empire, and nonetheless important place in trade as well. So very, very formidable empire, maybe um, one of the most significant at its time, and at least the most powerful to succeed the first Turkic Empire in the region. So as for the rise and fall, so the Khazar Khaganate was a powerful and influential semi-nomadic Turkic state that emerged in the steppes of the region of Central Asia. So many of the empires, the Khaganates particularly, tend to be nomadic, but this one was relatively more sedentary. Maybe as time went by, they became more sedentary after being nomadic for so long, they thought, hmm, well, we started building this building, might as well continue. So I think over time, the, the Khaganates hypothesis became more sedentary. So the hypothesis I pose and seem to have observed so far. Um, that, so then, it, th therefore, we will seek to find a history of its rise and fall. So starting with the rise of the Khazar Khaganate. So the exact origin of the Khazars are somewhat obscure, but they were believed to have migrated westward from Central Asia. So they came from the east. By the 6th century CE, the Khazars had established themselves as a dominant force in the Eurasian steppes, particularly in the region in the north of the Caucasus Mountains. The Khazars initially lived as a nomadic herders, but later formed a confederation of tribes under the centralized leadership structure. So, as common happens with these cognates, ruled by Khans, is there's many tribes, and then one seems to come become leader, or the most prominent, maybe to for the mutual benefit, and unites the tribes. There's a great book by Khan Igledun called Wolf of the Plains in a series, and it's about Genghis Khan, and an emperor would come later, or Khan who would come later, which is great to visualize sort of how they unite. Also, the title of this episode, Ages of Empires, there's a, there's a little campaign, Age of Empires was a game I used to play, um, about empires, and there's this sort of uh, scenario where you go as Genghis Khan and unite the tribes and collect people, and that's sort of how I visualize, and that's how the Kaganates played out, and that is true for this one. As for political organization and expansion, the Khazar Khaganate reached its peak during the 7th and 8th centuries under the rule of the Khagan or supreme ruler who governed with the assistance of the Council of Nobles and Tribal Leaders. So ruled by a Khagan, but also had a Council of Nobles, likely from other ruling tribes or within their own ruling leading tribe and other tribal leaders. The Khazars expanded their territory through a combination of military conquests, diplomacy, and alliances, which seems to be true for almost all the empires. Maybe some of them got by with excluding diplomacy. Some of them got, few got by with excluding conquests, and some got by excluding alliances as well. But this empire benefited from all three. They controlled key trade routes, particularly the west of the Silk Road, or northwest of the Silk Road, including the Silk Road, which facilitated economic prosperity and cultural exchange with neighboring civilizations, but also, also the sharing of knowledge, too. And also by trading, it diffuses war. If you're trading partners, you might be less inclined to go to battle against each other. As for conversion to Judaism, which is a very, very unique history, unique to this empire, specifically or to a nomadic empire, 
One of the most distinctive features of the Khazar Khaganate was its adoption of Judaism as the state religion. While the exact reasons for the conversion remain debated among historians, it is believed to have been a strategic move to maintain independence and neutrality in the face of pressure of the neighboring Muslim and Christian empires. So we have the Byzantine Empire, which is becoming Christian, and the Abbasid Caliphate, which was Muslim. So perhaps they choose Juda Judaism to be uh, distinct. Um, however, they, Islam and Christianity were still practiced by some in, within the Khaganate as well. But as we shall see, it was largely, perhaps, uh, uh, a good, perhaps, uh, debatably a good choice or a bad choice, but it is very certainly a unique choice. As for military strength and diplomacy, the Khazars were renowned for their military strength and prowess, and prowess in warfare. They successfully repelled invasions from Arab and Byzantine forces, establishing a buffer zone between the Islamic Caliphate and the Byzantine Empire. So these are not easy foes to, to succeed in victory against. The Byzantine Empire dates back from the, to the full Roman Empire, dating back to the Roman Republic, dating back to the Roman Kingdom, all of which we've covered. So they have a huge history of military prowess, and the fact that the Khazar Khaganate were as able to defeat them on many occasions was a very significant achievement. The Abbasid Caliphate was perhaps, I believe actually, it was the largest empire in the world at the time, then well, wouldn't be easy to defeat, but the Khazar Khaganate was successful in this, perhaps through their uh, abilities on uh, using cavalry, perhaps, or at least because they were nomad people, I hypothesized they were good with with cavalry. The Khazars also maintained, however, diplomatic relations with other regional powers, including the Abbasid Caliphate and the Byzantine Empire and various Slavic states. So not only did they succeed in battle, but they knew perhaps when it was time to negotiate and when it was time to hit the sword. Their strategic alliances and military alliances enabled them to maintain independence and influence in the region. So perhaps maybe they played each other against each other, maybe fighting with one and allied with the other at one time, and then switching or going vice versa. But nonetheless, like all the other empires we've covered so far, it leads eventually to decline and fragmentation. So by the 9th century, the Khazar Khaganate began to decline due to a combination of internal strife, external pressures, and socio-economic challenges. Factionalism among the Khazar nobility weakened the central authority. Factionalism seems to be common, and it's particularly in the Khaganates because they're, cent they're not as centralized. The Khan is sort of leader of the leading tribe, but another tribe could take that throne. It's not, they don't have some divine right as in other empires we covered. For example, the Egyptian, they were considered a god. No one would even consider contesting that. So, but that seems to be a common, very common theme for our, our nomadic empires but also inter, uh, external pressures and socio-economic challenges which they were largely dependent on for their success um, and while the emergence of new powers such as the kievan rus and the emerging turkic states challenged khazar dominance in the region which we saw kiev is very important additionally the decline of the silk road and the changes in the trade routes undermine the khazar economy so the silk road starts to decline which is sort of their lifeblood in terms of economy starts to decline and alternative trade routes start expanding. So they sort of lose out on the economic prosperity that they had greatly benefited from in the past. Thus came the end of the Khaganate. The Khazar Khaganate ultimately succumbed to internal unrest and external invasions. In the 10th century, the Kievan Rus under Prince Sviatoslav, the first of Kiev, launched a series, as we have an image of him on the slide we shall discuss, launched a series of successful military campaigns against the Khazars, capturing Khazar territories and weakening their power. It was ultimately from King of Kiev, King of Ukraine, uh, modern day Ukraine, that defeated them. Then the Khazar Khaganate fragmented into smaller polities after this defeat with some Khazar remnants assimilating into neighboring cultures, while others migrated westward into Eastern Europe. So their sort of heritage was sort of dispersed, perhaps maybe their Judaism also dispersed as well throughout those who defeated them or those who um, accepted the those who had been defeated. Thus, as for the legacy of the Khazar Khaganate, despite its eventual demise, the Khazar Khaganate left a lasting legacy on Eurasian history. The Khazars played a crucial role in shaping the geopolitical landscape of Eastern Europe and Central Asia during the early Middle Ages. The conversion to Judaism was particularly unique and cultural achievements contributed to a rich tapestry of Eurasian civilizations. Although the Khazar Khaganate no longer exists as a political entity, 
it remain, its memory and jurors and historical records, archaeological remains, and cultural heritage. It's a very unique period in history and a very unique nomadic empire. As, and nomadic empires are generally quite unique in the first place, but in the region, most of these empires were nomadic. And dating back from the Turkic empires, for example. So as for the significant leader, we have Kagan or Khan Bulan. So one of the most significant rulers of the Khazar Khaganate was Bulan, also known as Sabriel. Sabriel. Therefore, we should find a biography of his life, the life of Bulan. So some background information. Bulan was Khazar or king who led the, to the conversion of the Khazars to Judaism. So probably the most unique or one of the most unique things about the Khazar Khaganate was its adoption of Judaism. And this was done under Kagan Bulan. So that's why we certainly make him one of the most, if not the most significant leader of the empire. His name means elk or heart in Old Turkic. The date of his reign is unknown as the date of his conversion is hotly disputed, so they don't know when he converted either, or nor when he was born, or when he reigned, pardon me. Though it is certain that the Bulan reigned sometime between the mid-8th and mid-9th centuries, CE, Common Era. Nor is it settled whether Bulan was a Bek or a Kagan of the Khazars. Bek is perhaps a military leader, but I tend to hypothesize that he was the Kagan for being uh, able to implement such important changes or significant changes. The scholar D. M. Dunlop thought Bulan and his royal descendants, including Aaron II and Joseph, were Kagans because of the hereditary nature of this lineage and their interpretation of the word priest in Safar Ha'itam by Judah ben Bazalar. So if his descendants became Khans, it's likely that he was Khan or Kagan. However, more recent scholars, such as Dan Shapira and Kevin Brook, assume that Bulan was Bek, or sort of military uh, captain, due to reference to him leading military campaigns. So maybe the Kagan would not necessarily do this. And Bulan was religious, uh, and Khazar tradition held that before his conversion, Bulan was traditionally was religiously unaffiliated, so before that he wasn't religious as well. And in his quest to discover which of the three Abrahamic religions would shape his own religious beliefs, he invited representatives from each to explain their fundamental beliefs, and in the end he chose Judaism. So, so quick summary, but nonetheless he, he embraced and he endeavored to learn about all of them before making his decision and came with an open mind as well. So I think that's quite, quite the best way to approach it, whether or not there was a best decision or he made a best decision is to um, speculation. So as for his life, so early life and ascension. So Bulan was born in the early 8th century CE into the ruling elite of the Khazar Khaganate, either Kagan family or um, military captain. Most likely I proposed Kagan because his descendants were Kagans. His exact date of birth and parentage are not well documented, however, that's why that cannot be proved. But he was likely belonged to a noble aristocracy of the Khazar realm, so at least very noble. Bulan ascended to the throne of the Khazar Khaganate at a time of political turbulence and external threats. As for his conversion to Judaism, Bulan is renowned for his pivotal role in the conversion to, of the Khazar Khaganate to Judaism. While the exact circumstances of his conversion remain subject to debate among historians, it is believed Bulan embraced Judaism either as a result of personal conviction or for strategic reasons relative to the Byzantine Empire, which had adopted Christianity, and the Abbasid Caliphate, which was Muslim or practiced Islam. By adopting Judaism as the state religion, Bulan aimed to forge closer ties with the Jewish merchants and communities along the Silk Road, too. So there's also that economic benefit, too as well as to maintain a degree of independence from the neighboring Muslim and Christian empires. As for consolidation of power, following his conversion to Judaism, Bulan embarked on a series of reforms aimed at consolidating power and strengthening the Khazar state. He centralized authority, reorganized the administrative structure, and promoted Jewish religious institutions in the Khazar realm. Bulan's policies aimed to foster unity among the diverse ethnic and religious groups. So despite choosing one, he still wanted to have um, unity amongst them, including Turkic, Slavic, and Iranian peoples. As for military campaigns and diplomacy, Bulan's reign was marked by military campaigns against neighboring powers and his diplomatic maneuvers to safeguard Khazar interests. 
he successfully repelled incursions from Arab and Byzantine forces, maintaining the Khazar Khaganate's territorial integrity and independence. So he was also able to defend the borders as well. Bulan also formed diplomatic alliances with regional powers. I think it's one thing to be good in battle, but also equally as important to be good in diplomacy. But maybe one's diplomacy depends on their success in battle. But maybe one's success in battle depends on their diplomacy with regional powers, including the Abbasid Caliphate and the Byzantine empires, to con counterbalance external threats and secure trade routes. routes. As for his cultural pa patronage and legacy, Bulan was a patron of the arts, culture, and learning within the Khazar Khaganate. He promoted translation of Jewish texts to Turkic languages, so fostering intellectual um, endeavors into the empire by through the adoption of Judaism as well. He promoted the translation of Jewish, uh, Jewish texts into Turkish, or Turkic languages. Bulan's reign saw the flourishing of Jewish religious and intellectual life within the Khaganate and contributing to the cultural richness and diversity. Also, the economic benefits too, because a lot of the merchants were Jewish too, so that strengthened their economy as well. His conversion to Judaism had a profound and lasting impact on the identity of the Khazar Khaganate, certainly so, shaping the religious and cultural trajectory of for centuries to come. As for his later years and succession, uh, details about Bulan's later years and the circumstances of his death are unfortunately scarce in historical records. It is believed that he ruled the Khazar Khaganate for several decades, however, maybe up to 45 years. Following his death, however, Bulan was succeeded by his descendants, so likely he was the Khan, I suppose, who contributed to rule the Khazar realm, albeit with varying degrees of success. Bulan's legacy endured as a symbol of the Khazar Khaganate's unique religious and cultural identity in the annals of Eurasian history, as well as being a great military leader, defending the empire, and also great in diplomacy and understanding trade, and patronage of the arts, and most importantly, choosing a religion, which at least, if maybe not, obviously, it likely did pose many benefits to the empire, but at least it was certainly unique. So, as that is Kagan Bulan and the Khazar Khaganate, as for the content of the slide, so we have the title, Kagan Bulan and the Khazar Khaganate. They were a nomadic people that established a major commercial empire in Euro European Russia, southern Ukraine, Crimea, and Kazakhstan. And it was the most powerful polity to emerge from, break from the breakup of Western Turkic Khaganate for its duration. So, a very significant empire to follow after the Western Turkic Khaganate, which, which was derived from the first Turkic Empire, which split. As for significant leader, we have Kagan Bulan, Empire, Khazar Khaganate, period circa, that means approximately 650 to 690, or six, 969, pardon me, CE, which is considered part of the Middle Ages. Modern locations include Russia, the Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. Million square kilometers is 3.0, so quite a bit larger, um, about three times as large as the uh, Pratahara dynasty, for example, but they were nomadic, however, so it's not like they had cities for 3 million square kilometers. They were largely traveling, changing different locations across the years, a lot of temporary settlements as well. So although a larger region, it was less populated, it was more, and as well, they were not sedentary, they were not constantly inhabiting that whole region, but they did defend that whole region and it is on the larger side, maybe up to three times as large as probably the average empires we've been covering. A million square kilometers is 1.16 percent of the world, excluding Antarctica is 2.23 percent, uh, very, very large, of course, however, maybe relatively less populated than some other regions. For example, three million square kilometers in India would be uh, would have a much larger population, as we shall see. As for capital city, Balanjar was the capital from circa 650 to circa 720, Samandar from circa 720 to 750, and Atil from 750 to 969 CE. The government was a monarchy or ruled or Khaganate ruled by a Khan, but a, a through one's descendants, however. As for common languages were Oguric, which was the lingua franca, which is the common language, Old Turkic, which was the dynastic language, and it was spoken, the oral language, and Alania was also another oral language. The religions were Judaism, after, uh, due to the efforts of Kagan Bulan, or the decision of Kagan Bulan, uh, ju uh, ju uh, Judaism, I think I just spelt it, it again wrong, unless there's a new religion I, I, I typed out, but I believe that is an error. So, Tengrism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Paganism, and religious secretism. 
which is sort of adopting parts of many different religions. So many different religions here, but they did ultimately decide upon Judaism to be the predominant religion as a result of the decision of Kagan Bulat. Population was likely between two to four million people. So that does reach into the several million area, but it's likely a little bit smaller in population than the Pratahara dynasty, which covered a smaller, about a third of the region. So. As for the images, in the top left we have the Khazar Moses coin, which is Moses from the Old Testament, found in the Spillings Hoard and dated circa 800 CE. It is described with Moses is the messenger of God, instead of the usual Muslim phrase text, Muhammad is the messenger of God. So circa 800, that's where that shift from Islam to Judaism happened. Maybe this, um, maybe this theme was already happening, despite Kagan Bulan's efforts, or maybe Kagan Bulan was, 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 took a pivot and put it in that direction. It's, it's hard to speculate, but I think um, Kagan Bulan's um, actions were necessary. There's a, always, I always mention, there's sort of a Tolstoyan argument in the epilogue of War and Peace, where he says Napoleon was just the fastest cog in the wheel, he was an outsider, and that's why he rose to the top. So by, in fact, Tolstoy says that he really contributed nothing. It could have could have been anyone in that position. Whereas there's he contrasts that with Carlyle on heroes, hero worship, and history, where he writes that few great leaders have changed society. So there's the two opposing arguments. Is is it is history written by a few great people, or is hit or are these great people just the result of underlying social trend, social changes? So there's also the two different there's sociology, which is sort of how society might influence changes, and then political sciences, which is how often a top-down approach, top-down versus a bottom-up approach, can take, be taken either way. To what extent Kagan Bulan influenced the empire? I would say probably it was maybe more in his favor than it was his influence. And I tend to, to, to agree maybe more with Carlyle. At presently, that might change over time. To the right of that, we have a 10th century Kievan letter. So but it was written in Old Turkic, so we can get an image of what Old Turkic text looked like, or Orkhan, as we noted, was the lingua franca. An inscription phrase, Okudurum, um, that might be how it was pronounced, which means I read, or this is it, or this or it. So I read, or I read this or it. Svi, um, to the right of that is Sviatsolav, the first of Kiev in a boat who was destroyer of the Khazar Khaganate. So there weren't too many images I could find of the Khazar Khaganate being a nomadic people, so I thought I'd include an image of their, the one who would ultimately defeat them, the king of Kiev, uh, Sviatoslav, Sviatoslav, Sviatoslav. And he is also very important because he also defeated the first Bulgarian empire. So this, yeah, this leader from Kiev is the defeater of two very significant empires. So thought it would be important to include that image here. We've also covered the first Bulgarian Empire as well, which I'd be grateful if you, if you tune into as well. And if you already have, thank you very much. And as for additional information, so some of the important Kagans we have circa 650 was Ibris in the 8th century, we have Bulan, the 9th century, Obadia, the 9th century, we have Zachariah, the 9th century, so as you can see, they're starting to adopt more um, mosaic names. 9th century, Manasseh, the 9th uh, century again, Benjamin, the youngest tribe of Israel, of the 12 tribes of Israel. 10th century, Aaron, who is the, um, spoke for Moses. 10th century also we have Joseph, 10th century David, and 11th century Georgia, Georgios. So a lot of mosaic names, Joseph, Aaron, David. I am presently on the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, so about a thousand pages in. Um, that a friend of mine pointed out by saying the number of pages I'm in in the in the Bible is not very useful because the Bible is one of the most contracted texts. So a thousand pages in the Bible is a lot more than a regular book. But I'm about two thirds through the whole um, through, through the whole work. The New Testament accounts for a much smaller proportion of the Bible relative to the Old Testament. And in the top right, we have a map of the world in approximately 800 CE. So we have the Khazar Khaganate here. Um, Kiev would be over here, approximately. Here's the Byzantine Empire, which was a formidable threat. Christian, after Constantine, an empire we have covered. The Abbasid Caliphate, a Muslim empire. 
we have the Uyghur Khaganate, which is another important empire we have covered. We have the Tibetan Empire we have covered. Here we can see the Gujar Pratiharas down here, and also the Rashtra Kutas, so full circle, who would also maybe lead the decisive blow to them. And the Tang Dynasty also at this time. So some very important empires that we've covered. And if you've been following this series, it's all hopefully starting to really fit together. So with now as for the comparison, the style of Plutarch's parallel lives. So comparison or compare and contrast alleged uh, is the hope of, uh, of Raja Boja I and Gu of the Gurujara Pratahara dynasty and Kagan Bulan of the Khazar Khaganate. So Raja Boja I and of the Gujara Pratahara dynasty and Kagan Bulan of the Khazar Khaganate were both significant rulers in medieval history. But they belong to different regions, cultures, and different time periods, despite their empires overlapping generally. Therefore, we seek to find some comparisons and contrasts to see, because there's a quote from Anna Karenina, which I quote often, the opening phrase, and actually I learned the quote before I read the book from Peter Thiel. He says, all families, all happy families are alike, and all dysfunctional or unhappy families are different for different reasons. So it might be something going on that destroys the family, but why they fail is rarely the same reason, whereas all perfect families are essentially the same. So why, maybe assuming these two leaders are not perfect, how are they different, and perhaps what can we learn from that? So for the, as for the cultural background, Raja Boja I belonged to the Indian subcontinent and ruled of the Gurujara Pratahara dynasty, which was predominantly Hindu. And he patronized Saint Sanskrit literature and art and architecture, contributing to cultural uh, richness of the realm. As for Kagan Bulan, he belonged to the Eurasian steppe region and ruled over the Khazar Khaganate, which embraced Judaism as the state religion. So Hinduism and Judaism, significant difference there. And he played a key role in the conversion of the Khazar Khaganate to Judaism, fostering religious and cultural exchange with Jewish communities along the Silk Road. So perhaps Raja Boja I might have been perhaps maybe more of a scholar himself or maybe more of a patron of the arts. He did not change or establish the religion of Hinduism, whereas Kagan Bulan essentially set the stage for Judaism for centuries and generations to come. So maybe the influence in that in terms of religion might be larger in terms of Kagan Bulan just by virtue of changing it. But that doesn't mean one can have a bigger impact by maintaining than changing, but I think zero to one is often more than one to two, but not necessarily so. As for, and they could even be the same influence as well, but and but, but Raja Boja's the first influence in architecture might be more significant than Kagan Bulan, but that's because Kagan Bulan was Kagan of a nomadic empire. So further on their religious affiliation, Raja Bhutra I, as ruler of the Gujar Pratahara dynasty, was likely a follower of Hinduism, which was the predominant religion of the kingdom. He patronized Hindu temples and religious institutions, promoting worship of the Hindu deities. As for Gan Bhutan, he converted the Khazar Khaganate to Judaism, marking one of the few Jewish states in history. So that's a very significant uh, endeavor. And his conversion to Judaism had a profound impact on the religious and cultural identity of the Khazar Khaganate shaping its trajectory for centuries to come, and perhaps influencing Judaism generally for centuries to come. As for his military and as for their religious military and political achievements, Rajaboja I was known for his military campaigns and territorial expansion, which significantly extended the influence of the Gurjara Pratahara dynasty in North India. He also implemented administrative reforms and fostered diplomatic relations in neighboring kingdoms. Kagan Bulan successfully defe defended the Khazar Khaganate against external threats from Arab and, and Byzantine forces, so very formidable forces he was fighting against, and he forged diplomatic alliances as well with regional powers, securing trade routes and ensuring stability of the Khazar realm. So who was the better in military and political achievements is probably impossible to say. I think they were both successful in military, and they were both similar in that they both did endeavor to have uh, create alliances. But I, um, I, I'm not going to weigh in on which, whom I think was the more successful military leader. As for patronage of the arts and culture, well, perhaps, per uh, no, there, I, it's impossible to speculate who was the better uh, military leader, pardon me. As for patronage of the arts and culture, Raja Boja I was a patron of the Sanskrit language, literature, art, and architecture. 
He sponsored the construction of temples, forts, and palaces. Right? Beautiful, beautiful temples that still exist today, contributing to the cultural and architectural heritage of the kingdom. Whereas Kigan Bulan promoted the translation of Jewish texts into Turkic languages, very important literary achievements, fostering the spread of Judaism among the Khazar population. He supported Jewish religious and intellectual life within the Khaganate and contributed to its cultural richness and diversity. So both quite a uh, patron of the arts, literature, and etc. Uh, perhaps Kagan Bulan was more focused on Judaism, uh, well, certainly so, but Rajabhoja the first was also very focused on Hinduism as well. So they both do have that religious element and I think maybe more they're more similar in this realm than different relative to other leaders. But Kagan Bulan is perhaps maybe an exception relative to all leaders in fact that he chose a religion for the state. As for the legacy, Rajabhoja I is remembered as one of the greatest rulers of the Gurjara Pratahara dynasty, known for his military achievements, administrative reforms, and patronage of the arts and culture. As for Kagan Bulan, his conversion to Judaism had a profound lasting impact on the identity of the Khazar Khaganate, shaping its religious and cultural trajectory for centuries to come. He was revered as the ruler who established Judaism as a state religion of the Khazar realm. As for both of them, background, I guess, both of them likely came from the most powerful family at the time. There is speculation that Kagan Bulan was more likely a uh, military leader, which might make his achievements all the more greater, but I, I speculate that he's more likely was the Kog Kagan, because his descendants became the Kagans as well. So thus, while Rajabhoja I and Kagan Bulan were both influential regents in their respective regions, they had distinct cultural backgrounds, religious affiliations, and military achievements. Bhojira I's legacy is associated with Hinduism, military conquests, and cultural patronage in North India, whereas Bulan is remembered for his conversion to Judaism and the cultural religious transformation of the Khazar Khaganate in the Eurasian steppes. Maybe to weigh in on that military argument, I would maybe give Rajabhoja I a slight advantage in being more of the military leader, whereas Kagan Bulan might have been more defensive relative to the, the uh, Byzantine Empire and the Abbasid Caliphate. So that is the uh, this episode of Ages of Empires. I very much appreciate it on Raja Boja I of the Gurjara Pratahara dynasty and Kagan Bulan of the Khazar Khaganate. I really appreciate your support. This is Ages of Empires. My name is Kaylin Ashcroft, and I'm very grateful for your support, and I'll be very grateful if you continue to provide, to provide it. Thank you so much.